All right, hello everybody, we're in Unit 7, we're on page 9 of Unit 7. Why do processes need control? Uh, processes need control because most processes are exposed to factors that can cause a disturbance. A disturbance is anything that disrupts the normal flow of energy or materials and changes the process results. Some disturbances are caused by us, some disturbances are... Um, accidents for lack of a better term you know a piece of machinery breaks things like that that causes a leak those can be all be disturbances as well if you change the input or flow of energy and materials or other conditions you will change the output or result processes can be upset or disrupted by variation in materials variations in energy resources changes in the external environment and of course human error in manufacturing most other endeavors you do not want just any result you need a particular result that's the same every time the process is repeated Think about this for a second. I went to um, Wendy's tonight, and um, I got sweet tea. And that sweet tea was so sweet that it was almost like syrup. It was a very sweet, sweet tea. Other times I go to Wendy's, their sweet tea barely has any sugar in it at all. And other times it's just right. It's like Goldilocks and the Three Bears in that case. Imagine for a second if Coca-Cola, now Coca-Cola is a company that has a very well-established product. In fact, it's probably one of the biggest name brands known. Imagine every time you opened a bottle of Coke and drank it, that one time it was just way too sweet or maybe a little bit too sweet the next time. Now this happens in fountain drinks. This happens in, um, work, like at the movie theater, we work at fountain drinks. This happens when syrup runs out or carbon dioxide runs out. But as far as the bottle drinks go, I've yet to encounter a situation where one time it was just too sweet or another time it wasn't sweet, um, it wasn't sweet enough. It's always the exact same consistent quality. And that is what we're trying to reach. We're trying to reach that every single time you take a swallow of Coca-Cola, you know it's going to taste exactly like this. And you can expect that quality and you will get that quality because we have quality process control procedures in place. That's what process control is all about. You don't want to, you don't want it to be like McDonald's or Bojangles or any place that serves sweet tea. I mean, heck, even in my house, you know, we, we serve sweet tea. Some days it's really sweet. Some days it's not so sweet. Um, some days it's a little bit darker than others. Some days a little bit lighter than others. We want a consistent quality product every single time. And that's what process control allows us to do. Process control systems produce consistent output, products, and results, even if the process is disrupted or changed by some type of disturbance. If a disturbance is severe enough, some process control systems may even shut down production until the situation is assessed and appropriate action is taken. This last, this first sentence of this last paragraph, which is just one paragraph sentence itself, you need to know this sentence. Keeping the process stable to achieve consistent results is the basic purpose of process control. Know that. Please know that. I'm going to start again. Keeping the process stable to achieve consistent results is the basic purpose of process control. But some process control systems are also designed to keep people safe from harm and to keep properties safe from damage. Why do process need control? Once again, that very first bullet, you need to know this, to keep a process stable and efficient. To prevent accidents, injury to people, to help produce desired results, to free up time for employees to devote to other tasks, and to prevent damage to the equipment. Bottom line, process control saves time and money. And what is anything but time and money? So, in the example of what we were looking at previously, um, and let me go back for a second to it, this idea of keeping uh, liquid inside of a tank, we probably would have four different sensors or four different levels that we would want to monitor. We would have a minimum, which is the dangerous point. We would have a low point. We would have a high point, and we would have a maximum point. Uh, minimum might be like where your, ga your low gas light comes on. Okay, it says, hey, you, you need to go get gas now. I don't know why you've waited this long, but you need to go get gas. Um, or, or either low. Low could be that point as well. Minimum could be where it's completely empty. Though it doesn't look like they've marked it out like that on this uh, picture. But basically what it's saying is that whenever the liquid reaches the low mark, it tells the control system, hey, start the pump up, refill the tank. And the tank should get all the way to the high point and stop and turn off and there's usually going to be a little bit of extra that comes out through, 
And that's why there's a difference between a high and a maximum. Maximum is the most amount it can hold, and that, that itself can actually cause an alarm if you overfill it. You ever been pumping gas before and had a little catch on, and it just, for some reason, it didn't cut off and kept flowing? You, you don't want that to happen, okay? So uh, definitely want to keep this, um, definitely want to be able to monitor that situation. Um, on page 11, uh, activity, process, variables, and disturbances, uh, they're talking about filling a tub with bath water. Uh, the process variables that you have to do when using bath water is the level of the water, the temperature of the water, and the flow of the water. How fast is it flowing out? Uh, the, the things that can disturb the process is if the drain plug is leaking, then obviously every time you put water in the tub, water's going to be draining. You know, so you're going to have to overcome that. Um, room air temperature, if it's really cold in the room, is going to make the water get colder faster. If it's really hot, then it may keep the water warmer longer, and it depends on what you're trying to do. And then, of course, the temperature of the tub itself is going to affect the temperature of the water in it as well, because it is going, it is the vessel that is containing this temperature. Heating your home is the next example at the bottom of page 11. It says what must be observed, measured, or adjusted. You need to do the inside air temperature. That's what you need to monitor, and as well as the fuel supply to the furnace. Now, for most of us, that is an automated process by our thermostats. Either it's electricity or natural gas or kerosene or whatever it is that we're using to heat. It knows, hey, we need more heat. Let's apply more fuel to the flames. If you live in a place that has a fireplace with logs of wood, then you in that case will actually be the person dealing with the fuel supply to the furnace. You'll pick up the logs, put them on the fire, stoke the fire, make sure it's working properly, um, and be able to do that. Things that can disturb heat in your home include windows being left open, poor insulation, dirty f uh, filters on the furnace, power failure, number of people in the room, the heat generated by the lights, and they actually... I don't know how big of a difference it makes, but I guess it depends on your house. Um, the oven, if the oven's on and the door's open on the oven, that can actually heat up the room pretty quickly. Um, on process three, on page 12, maintaining a certain liquid level in a tank with an inlet and an outlet. And this is, again, just like that picture that we keep looking at. Um, it has an inlet and an outlet. The liquid level and the rate of liquid flow in and out of the tank is what you need to monitor. Leaks can disturb the process. Process changes upstream and downstream can disturb the process as well. And then last but not least, process four on page 12, keeping the pH level constant in a swimming pool. Uh, the pH level is a process variable. The amount of chemicals that you add that can affect the pH level, as well as the amount of water in the pool can affect the pH level as well. Things that can change um, input and water supply, rainfall. Rainfall is slightly acidic. Kids urinating in the pool or adults, doesn't have to be kids, and evaporation. All of these things can affect your pH. We're going to stop there.